Good evening. My name is Leanne Martin, and I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And I, along with Associate Dean Mark Geisler, Catherine Shornick, Angie Vandenhock, and Kim Ayer, would like to welcome you to tonight's installment. It's the second installment of the Dean's Lecture Series for this academic year. Tonight's lecture is brought to you really through a wonderful partnership between the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the City of Bellingham, who is providing this wonderful venue, and also Bellingham Television, who is not only televising this right now, but also recording it so that they can show it in upcoming weeks. So thank you for your partnership, and thank you to the CHSS staff for helping out. And just as a matter of housekeeping, after David finishes talking, there will be time for questions and comments. Mark Geisler will be walking around the audience with the microphone, and because we are recording, please wait until you get the microphone before you start speaking, so thank you for that. The last sentence of the CHSS mission statement reads, together students, faculty, and staff generate knowledge, pursue research, and foster lifelong learning to contribute to the well-being of communities local to global. Tonight's speaker, Dr. David Sadler, He's a professor in the Department of Psychology, demonstrates his commitment to well-being through his extensive work. David has co-authored multiple books on child and lifespan development and social psychology. He's appeared on national and international television, including CNN, ABC News, NBC Nightly News, CBS This Morning, and the Discovery Channel. And he talks about cyberbullying and the psychological effects of disasters. David is on the editorial board of the Journal of Traumatic Stress. He's received about $600,000 in research grants, has had about 80 conference presentations, 30 publications, and over 50 presentations to universities and government agencies and community groups to talk about cyberbullying, traumatic stress, response to disaster, and other kinds of psychological stress. David is also wonderful in involving our students as co-authors in his research. David has also established the Tsunami Museum in Thailand to provide information to survivors and to visitors. And this museum has also served as an educational site for the local village children. The museum has been so successful that they've been able to provide funds to hire teachers, to repair buildings, to provide clean water, nutritious meals, school supplies, and even build a house for, for children orphaned by the tsunami. And if all these things don't contribute to the well-being of local and global communities, I'm not sure what does. So it's with great pleasure and respect that I present to you Dr. David Sadler. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. And very special thank you to uh, Dean Martin for that very warm introduction. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the City of Bellingham for hosting the presentation tonight, as well as BTV. Um, Western Washington University is a phenomenal university, highly ranked in West Coast universities. We're very um, honored to be uh, part of the faculty. The College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Department of Psychology, Western Washington University undergraduate and graduate students have been very, very active in our research program, and I'm very grateful to them for their participation as well in some of the projects that we'll be speaking about tonight. And in addition, I'd like to thank my family for their support and uh, words of encouragement throughout all of these projects. So I'd like to begin by saying that to anyone who has been bullied, to anyone who has been cyberbullied, and to those parents of those who have, please know that many people in Bellingham, in Washington State, and around the country support you. Teachers, school administrators, school staff, parents, college professors, police officers, attorneys, and others are working hard to create a safer place for everyone. Please know that you are not alone. Please know that things do get better and that you are in our thoughts and our prayers. With that, let's look at what's going on today with social networking. So we have a phenomenal revolution with technology. Since when, 2007, when the iPhone came around, things have changed radically. Social networking sites have created wonderful new spaces for teens and adults to interact. For most teens, these are exciting and rewarding spaces. But unfortunately, the majority have also seen a darker side. For a subset of teens, the world of social media is not a pretty place because it prevents, presents a climate of drama and mean behavior. And tonight, that's what we'll be focusing on. We'll look at situations where people are engaging in mean behavior, in bullying behavior. We'll look at why that's happening, what's contributing to it, and what we can do about it. I'd like to begin by showing you a vignette of a situation that happened a few years ago. This is 15-year-old Jacqueline who was bullied at school and on the internet. 
For Jacqueline, bullying began with name calling on the bus and bullying in the hallway. Then last month, someone created a website posting her picture and poking fun at her lipstick and long black hair. Taking it a step further, they also added her home address, telephone number, and obscenity-laden descriptions of her. The website was posted for a month before rumors and whispering led to one of her friends telling her about the website. When she learned about the posting on the website, her hands were shaking. She now refuses to go to school and says that she feels threatened. Just a few months ago, this is in November, state of New York, four teens created a video. The video had obscenities, the video had threats. These children now have been uh, charged with cyberbullying. North Carolina, student arrested for cyberbullying on Instagram. What happened? Police arrested one suspect for posting a nude photo of a classmate charged with cyberbullying. Uh, threatening texts to students leads to arrests. This is in Oceanside, California. What happened? 18-year-old Miracosta, Miracosta College student was arrested. Text threats to kill several El Camino High School students was arrested on suspicion of making criminal threats, cyberbullying, and possessing an illegal weapon on college campus. New Jersey, North New Jersey. Student identified in Manchester Regional Cyberbullying Attack. What happened? Launched a series of vulgar online attacks against another student. There are plans to file juvenile delinquency charges against this female student. Connecticut. Two Watertown High School students have been arrested. Twitter harassment, charged with a breach of peace. They created an anonymous Twitter account, made harassing comments to about 40 other students. Comments were demeaning, included sexual and homophobic terms. Twitter shut down the original page, but the two students created another page and continued this harassment. Detective Mark Conway, the department's designated cyber crimes investigator, obtained several search warrants to determine who had created the account and who was responsible for posting the comments. Now this is extremely important that everyone understand. There are police officers, police officers who are dedicated to looking at cyber crime. And I'm very pleased that today we have one of our esteemed police officers from Western Washington University who in a little while will talk to you about Washington state law. North Dakota, teen girl accused of cyberbullying, felony charges of terrorizing, harassment, and hindering law enforcement. They allege she sent threatening messages to multiple people online through and through text messaging. St. Petersburg, 15-year-old girl, used an app called Kick. Here we have Instagram. This is just south of us in Oregon, where school officials are frustrated with media sites they say like Facebook and Instagram, which they say should put more resources into preventing and dealing with bullying. I will not read to you these comments. These are horrific comments that are posted on a YouTube video in response to a teenager's video in which she sings along with popular songs. And this is what she gets for that. And here's another page of comments. And here's another page of comments. Nobody deserves to be treated like this. These are available to anyone around the world. And in fact, she's in an, as far as we know, she's in another country. So here in the United States, we have seen comments made about her. Nobody deserves that. Instagram beauty pageants raise concern. This is a new issue where girls as young as 12 and 13 are posting images of themselves and asking any of 30 million users of Instagram to judge their photos, and if they're rated as such, a big red X is placed over their face, and that's it. 12 years old, this is happening. These comments, whether positive or negative, can influence self-esteem and how adolescents view themselves. It can impact identity formation. Adolescents are using this feedback, these number of likes, as a measure to determine if they're accepted by others. They may ask people to click like and to follow their blog or their posts. Peer pressure to conform and participate can be intense. 
Here's another comment of a 16-year-old girl. It's one thing when you get made fun of at school, but to be bullied in your own home via your computer is a disgusting thing for someone to do. And I think anyone who gets kicks out of it is disgusting. It makes me feel badly about myself. It makes me wonder how people can be so rude and disrespectful of others and makes me lose faith in the human race. It decreases my self-esteem, and I often wonder what I did to make someone treat me that way. This is what a good proportion of our adolescents are dealing with today. And of course, it's very important to reflect on what that experience is compared to someone who is 30 years old or older went through. Adolescence was hard enough then. So consider what the adolescent folks are going through. Um, they're confronting these situations during a period in their lives that's critical for social development, that's critical for cognitive development. They're increasingly turning to their peers for more emotional support as they gain more independence from their parents. They're increasingly concerned about looking and behaving or conforming with their peers. They're developing a sense of identity, of standards, of values, developing moral reasoning and abstract thought. They're continuing to develop the ability to carefully evaluate the long-term consequences of their choices and to control their impulses. The region of the brain that controls these executive functions is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is one of the last to mature. And here you see brain images of a five-year-old, a preteen, teen, and a 20-year-old in the upper right-hand quadrant, uh, based on the color, you're seeing maturity, maturing of the brain. And so this is a time when judgment is still developing. And that's very important for parents, we all know this, but very important for parents to, to keep in mind, and I think visually seeing that kind of drives it home. Of course, some adolescents will experience an increasing sense of invulnerability that false belief that problems that happen to other people will not happen to them. We, adolescents may look for opportunities for sensation seeking or engage in risky behaviors. And of course, a good portion of adolescents may experience feelings of insecurity. That is not uncommon as part of adolescence. That's the context that I'd like you to keep in mind when we look at what teenagers are experiencing today. What are they experiencing today compared to just 2006, not very long ago? Teens are sharing more information about themselves in 2013 compared to 2006 in their social media profiles. 91% are posting photos, up 79% compared to 2006. 71% posting their school name. Why is that important? Because now we've narrowed where they are. Now we've narrowed the city, the state, the city, the school. 71% posting the city or town, 53% their email addresses, up from 29% in 2006, 20%, one out of five, posting their cell phone number. What about kindness and cruelty? Close to half has had one, at least one negative experience. Of those, about a quarter, 25% have had a face-to-face -face argument or confrontation as a result. 22%, one out of five, have ended their friendship in response to something that was posted on a social networking site. 13% created a problem with their parents as a result. 13% also felt nervous about going to school the next day. And 8% leading to a physical fight. So clearly there are implications for home, there are implications for school teachers, principals, administrators as well. About one in five teens have been bullied in person, online, by text or by phone. Of these, about 12% have been bullied in person in the last 12 months. About 9% bullied via text message, 8% bullied online, 7% bullied by telephone call. Very interesting to see what people are observing, but then also how they're responding to what they're seeing online. So almost everyone, 95%, 95% of teenagers have witnessed cruel behavior that others have ignored. In other words, this is extremely common experience today for an adolescent. 84% seen someone defend someone being harassed. That's positive. 84% also seen someone tell another person to stop. Positive. 67% witnessed others joining in the harassment. 
And I'll just ask you, you can see what you might think here in terms of responding to the mean behavior. What did adolescents do? This is what adolescents are reporting that they've done. Okay, so ignoring the mean behavior, what percentage ignore the mean behavior? 90%. One out of three is doing so often. Defending the victim, what percentage are defending the person who's being harassed? Almost 80% positive. Told the person to stop being mean and cruel, about 79% and joined online cruelty instigated by others about one out of five once again. This next statistic, extremely important. Almost half of teens admit to lying about their age in order to gain access to a website or an online account. That has extremely serious implications as we'll see. One out of three, 30%, are sharing a password with someone. A friend, a boyfriend, or girlfriend, also extremely serious implications because some friendships fall apart and some of those people then in that broken relationship may, for whatever reason, use that person's username and password to log into their account and do things. And that has consequences. There may be legal consequences of that as well. Among 14 to 17 year olds, more girls are sharing their passwords than boys. Who are they turning to for advice? Parents are the number one source that they're looking to. What this means is that parents, we have got to understand what's happening, what the experience is with our children today. Things are changing extremely fast. It's a very dynamic situation. New websites are popping up regularly, as you know. New apps are being created regularly. New social networking sites, that's the, that's the social networking side of the day that people like, change. And it's very difficult to keep up. We have to do so. Teachers at, or an adult at school are next, followed by brother, sister, or cousin, friends or classmate, and then older relative. But that's not all. This is a very popular social networking site. If you haven't heard about it, um, you need to know about it. It's called Ask FM. And someone posted a comment. This is a very important question he or she posted. He or she asks of anyone on Ask FM. Someone said they were going to track me down and that they called the police, so I quickly deactivated. Can the police still find me? Someone answers yes, and another person answers, most sites register your IP address, IP is internet provider address, which can be tracked through your internet service provider, ISP. So if you were doing something illegal, then the police could still find you, even if you close your account. So they are looking for to other folks for information about what's happening. Next study, extremely important. This is uh, June of last year. According to a recent survey conducted by McAfee, the security company, tweens in those ages 10 to 12 and teens are spending a lot of time unsupervised, unsupervised on social media, and parents are pretty clueless about it. If you look at the hand, Here's the reason why. I believe here are two contributing factors. Wireless and handheld are incredibly terrific technologies. To have wireless, to have cellular service, wonderful, wonderful technologies. To be able to hold it in my hand, wonderful technology. The problem is now, instead of having the desktop computer that's in the family room, that's in a shared room, in a den, that parents can see, that we all can look on the screen and see what's happening, now the child can take whatever device it is, look at it, and it's their world, and it's not your world. They can go in their room and shut their door. They can sit on the couch in a family room or a den, and you don't know what they're doing, who they're interacting with, what they're saying, and what they're reading. And that's a significant hurdle that we all need to address and decide how we're going to solve that in our own homes. This age group is technically too young to open social media accounts, at least according to the companies that administer them, yet most have at least one account, at least one, usually more, and are using it without supervision from their parents. This is, if you haven't seen a graph like this before, this is a completely different experience for teenagers than what adults are having today in 2014. It's a completely different experience. Almost 4,000 texts that's combined, received, and sent per month, and we don't have younger than 18 on this graph. Um, the bar went higher probably than the graph would fit. Very common way of interacting, of course. 
So with all of that, what is cyberbullying? Cyberbullying is the use of any digital technology with the intent to hurt, defame, or embarrass another person. Ways it can be delivered or occur, uh, it can occur on, via abusive calls, instant messages, text messages, blog posts, pictures or video clips, email, social networking sites, chat rooms, children and adolescents this is also an important point. And others may use other terms to describe these acts. They may not consider their own acts as bullying. That's very important. The terminology that we may use, cyberbullying, bullying, is not the terminology that they likely are to use. They know the words mean and cruel and might associate those with those actions, but that's very important when we're trying to educate and discuss these situations with them. There are various forms of cyberbullying. There's something called flaming, which is using hostile or vulgar, vulgar language in online fights, harassment, denigration, instigating and disclosing, so this might include influencing others to gang up on a person, impersonation, pretending to be someone, exclusion, and cyberstalking. So there are distinct characteristics with cyberbullying that are a part, uh, are part of bullying but also distinct from bullying. The first three they share in common. By bullying, I mean in-person bullying intent to harm, there's a power imbalance, so this power dynamic is central to the question of bullying or harassment, and this re repetition of harmful behaviors. It happens over and over and over again. But then with cyberbullying, the dynamic starts to change. The victim can't hide from the bully one at home. This is an extremely important concept. If someone is being bullied at school, there's a limited number of people who see it, let's say in a hallway, the person has that experience and goes home and is safe. They have respite from the bullying situation. But with cyberbullying, all they have to do is turn on their computer, look at their iPod, whatever it might be, and it's there, right there. And so it's very, very difficult for them to escape it. And I want you to consider that mindset of what that's like to not be able to get away from it day after day after day, night after night after night. It's a very challenging dynamic with cyberbullying. As we've discussed earlier, the audience is potentially large. <clears throat> Bully in the hallway, a couple people may see it. Here, anyone can see it around the world. The bully also is usually anonymous. It doesn't mean that the person doesn't know the other person, but in terms of who's posting those messages, we may not know. Very important dynamic. These next three are essential that we address. The bully may not have clear opportunities for empathy or to show remorse. Bystanders may feel that they don't need to intervene and the bully lacks the opportunity to show his or her abusive power immediately or to get reinforced immediately. In other words, if we're in the hallway and we see the bully situation happen and the person who's being harassed hit may cry, and the bully has an opportunity to see that emotional reaction and get feedback, information that says this is not good. But with cyberbullying, that bully doesn't get that feedback. He gets no or she gets no feedback. And as a result, that may influence him or her to continue to post until he or she gets that reaction. And as you'll see, one of the best recommendations is do not react. If someone posts something, let it go. It may hurt, but if you respond, it feeds it. And the person gets feedback that he or she had an impact, and it may continue. So in a survey recently of 9 to 19-year-olds, this question of anonymity, this question of disinhibition due to anonymity, people won't know, so I'm kind of disinhibited. I'm more likely to do it, as well as the inability of the person cyberbullying to see the consequences are the three key components that they're most concerned with. Involvement in cyberbullying is also associated with traditional bullying. There's a very close relationship, it's about 50% overlap. Rule-breaking behavior, frequency of online communication, the more likely someone is on, the more frequently they're on, the more likely they're to be involved. And then also a very important component, being in a family that tends to have less parent-child involvement, less affection, and more conflict. Both bullying and cyberbullying are due in part to a lack of adult supervision. 
often begin at school and commonly are initiated by someone who knows the victim. Extremely important research recently published looking at bullying and morality shows that bullies tend to have adequate moral competence. By that we mean that they understand right versus wrong. Very, very important. So where do they differ in terms of morality? Where they differ is in moral compassion, this question of empathy, the ability to understand the experience, to put themselves in the other person's shoes and say, what's that experience like? And when we're going to talk about interventions and what should be done at schools, what should be done at home, here's one of the keys. This is extremely important to consider, the question of morality. Harmful effects of cyberbullying include mental health consequences, sadness, hurt, anger, frustration, and confusion, stress and depression, low self-esteem, helplessness, social anxiety, fear, feeling vulnerable, feeling alone or isolated, diminished self-worth, and even suicidal ideation. There can be health problems such as headaches, sleep disturbances. There can be academic consequences, school absence, not feeling safe, lower academic performance, as well as a higher risk for school problems. Also may experience aggressive or deviant behavior, increased alcohol use, increased drug use or abuse, smoking, delinquency, and a greater likelihood of carrying a weapon to school. There have been cases of active, shooter, active shooters around the country. These are extremely horrific incidences. One of my key questions now is what are the norms? What are the rules for how to act online? Going back to what we talked about earlier, this is a new phenomenon. Where are the rules to say how you're supposed to act? Where are the norms? Right now in this wonderful chamber, there are norms that are influencing all of us. I didn't tell you how to act in this room. Nobody told me how to act in this room. But there are norms that are influencing our behavior. And there are norms that society has developed over many, many years that we all agree to. They're unspoken terms. But when you have a new concept, a new environment like cyberspace, those norms have to develop. And so one of my concerns is that norms are developing, but who's developing those norms? If we've made the case that teenagers are doing something far more frequently than adults are doing it, and if teenagers are primarily interacting among themselves without adults, who's establishing those norms? Who's establishing those rules of behavior? And what are the consequences for violating those norms? How can we better inform adolescents about what is and what is not appropriate behavior on the internet? So this is a very, very new environment. When you consider where we've been in the last 100 years and looking where we're at today, but in the last five years and the last seven years, things have changed radically. Here's an attempt by a school to establish a norm regarding how students should act when they get online. They say, think. T, is it true? Is what you're going to write helpful? Is it expiring? Is what you're going to write necessary? And is what you're going to write kind? I think that's a very important start. Here are other approaches that have been used to try to establish norms. These might be in school classes. When children are growing up, we te teach them these things. Here's another sign that could be in a classroom, all trying to establish norms for what's appropriate behavior. And as it turns out, in a classroom, the norms in a classroom among the students can influence their attitudes as to whether bullying is acceptable or not. And so in this important study, we see that group norms shared among students in classrooms are associated with acceptance of bullying. In other words, students are more likely to believe bullying is acceptable and bullying is a significant uh, and they're more likely to bully if a significant uh, number of other students in the classroom support bullying. So there's a dynamic that gets transferred. Kids learn from other kids in the classroom. Teachers need to be very aware of this, that what dynamic they present in their classroom will influence the children as well. So here's another attempt to establish norms or rules. User agreements. If you want to use Instagram, if you want to use Facebook, if you want to use Twitter, you have to agree to their terms and conditions. Here is an example of Instagram's homepage. 
in the lower right hand corner we have their terms. Question is, do you read it? Question is, do you have to read it in order to get onto Instagram? I've got some yeses and I've got some noes, people shaking their head. Okay, well let's find out. Here is a page of their terms, this is just the very beginning. Um, I underlined or put and highlighted a couple words, must versus may not. I think there's a significant difference between those terms, but this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning, if you can scroll after scroll after scroll, page, screen after screen after screen of terms, okay? So what's the minimum age for Instagram? 13, all right? We've documented that kids less than 13 are gaining access to these sites, yes. Consumer Reports says six million kids under 13 are accessing these sites. So I went ahead and I got all of their terms and conditions and I subjected it to a readability test, which tells us at what grade level the user needs in order to understand the terms and conditions. The grade level for Instagram is grade level 14. Grade level 14, that's a sophomore in college. How old do you have to be to understand the terms and conditions? 19 to 20 years old. And their minimum age is 13 years old to allow them access to Instagram. And kids less than 13 are accessing Instagram. And we've just talked earlier about these beauty pageants. Do they understand what they're agreeing to? Who's establishing the rules about what's appropriate behavior? Who's telling the kids? If these rules are, do the kids understand? This data suggests no, they don't. What about Facebook? Here's Facebook. To sign up, it says in the small text, it gets smaller here. By clicking sign up, you agree to our terms. You don't have to read the terms. You're agreeing to our terms. But let's go ahead and run their terms through a readability analysis and see what grade level you have to be at. You have to have a grade level of about 13. You need to be a freshman in college to understand Facebook's terms and conditions or about 18 to 19 years of age, okay? So I have serious questions about what information is being presented in terms of rules but also in terms of normative information. So with 12 Western undergraduate students, uh, we are presenting a paper at the annual meeting of the Association for Psychological Science shortly regarding this study, which is a pilot study to develop and assess an intervention designed to reduce cyberbullying comments on YouTube. Here's our question. If norms aren't being presented by the sites, might we recommend something they might do? Might we recommend a strategy that they might implement to present norms? And might these norms influence what people post? I showed you earlier very horrific comments in response to a YouTube video. Could those be toned down? Could you influence people to tone that down depending on what you say? So we came up with the idea of having a pop-up window appear if someone wants to post a comment and you have to read something in this pop-up window. And then you're allowed to post what you want to say. And so we harnessed the very important, very influential concept of norms to tell people what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. We used injunctive norms, which indicate behaviors that are typically approved of or disapproved of. We use descriptive norms, which say behaviors that are commonly performed. And we also examined whether comments posted by others would influence the content that were written by the participants, okay? This was not actually on YouTube. We had a, a kind of a dummy website built where people saw a video, they saw the pop-up, and were given an opportunity to write their comments. Here's the injunctive norm pop-up window. It says, please do not post mean or attacking comments in order to create a welcoming and safe online environment. That's it. And now you can post. The descriptive norm said many users on this site have created mean or attacking comments, which creates a threatening and hurtful online environment. They saw the comments that I showed you earlier, and what did we find? We found that, lo and behold, the injunctive norm information, which you see here again, please do not post mean or attacking comments in order to create a welcoming and safe environment online, worked. People wrote more positive comments when they saw this pop-up compared to the one they did not see that pop-up. You can argue, well, if you keep showing this pop-up, people will get used to it. Change the pop-up, rotate it, have different versions of it. 
um, standing up against bullies. Participants viewing the negative comments posted by others wrote more positive comments uh, compared to those uh, in the other condition. And compassion, females felt more compassion as a result of watching the video than males. So this question of empathy is coming up again. Okay. Um, for future research, we're developing other pop-ups. This is true. You may be guilty of harassment if you post comments that intend to harass, intimidate, or embarrass. The 12-year-old girl uh, was uh, guilty for uh, cyberbullying a classmate and was punished with probation and community service. This is uh, a few years ago. In the next study that I conducted with 14 undergraduates at Western who were co-authors of a paper that we presented this last summer at the American Psychological Association Conference, we wanted to see what could be done on the campus of Western to promote understanding about cyberbullying and cyber harassment. So we decided to produce a video. In that video, we had a police officer discussing Washington State cyber harassment and cyber stalking laws and actions that students can take to prevent and respond to cyber harassment. We also included students discussing, West, discussing Western's norms and values in opposition to cyberbullying and university policies and resources for victims. At this time, I'd like to introduce Sergeant Carpenter of the Western Washington University Police Force, who will talk to you a little bit about the Washington state law addressing cyber stalking. And that is presented on the screen as well. Thanks, Dr. Sattler. When Dr. Sattler asked me to come talk about the RCWs and how they relate to cyber stalking, I thought, well, he's just going to have them up on the board. What can I tell anybody? But really, what I want you to know is that the police are diligently investigating these cases, and the prosecutors are really diligently prosecuting the cases, especially where there's bodily threats that are being uh, uh, thrown out there. Um, this is a serious problem more than ever. People are, right, we have adolescents killing themselves over mean tweets and over uh, posts on Facebook. So we've, I've had the experience to investigate a couple. We have, we have an officer that's dedicated just to cyber crimes. So if we have a cyber crime, we'll ask him to investigate it. And he's pretty diligent in what he can do. Um, prosecutors are given a lot of leeway in how they can investigate these crimes, especially when there's threats occurring. Recent case in Bellingham was just prosecuted uh, last week, I think she was prosecuted and sentenced this week, or maybe today. And uh, it goes to show you that they'll prosecute anything where there's threats made. Uh, quotes like, I will ruin your life, get back at you, or you need to kill yourself are really alarming, and that's why we really are we're really hammering down on how we investigate these cases. Um, schools, the schools now are going to get involved in that. If they know about the, the bullying or the stalking, they have to report them. They're compelled to report these. And the schools can create their own sanctions, especially if the tweet happened in a class. A person is guilty of cyber stalking if she or he with intent to harass, intimidates, torments, embarrasses any other person under any circumstances not constituting telephone harassment, which is a different form of harassment, make an electronic communication to such person or third party. What people need to know is third party means maybe it's going to affect the mom or dad when the people threaten to burn the, to burn the building down or kill the horse. All of a sudden, that's a third party, and you've got your problems have just been exasperated. Uh, using any lewd, lascivious, Indecent or obscene words, images, language, suggesting the commission of any lewd or lascivious act. So expressing any uh, sexual desires or whatnot. Um, anonymously or repeatedly, whether or not conversation occurs. I've already talked about threatening to inflict injury on the person or the property of the person called or any member of his family or household. This is a gross misdemeanor, which can mean substantial jail time. Gross misdemeanors can mean up to 90 days or correction up to one year in jail. Um, the gross misdemeanor, except if you've been convicted once and then you harass the same person again, it all of a sudden jumps to a class C felony. So they can prosecute it as a class C felony. 
And obviously, you can do the math. That's a lot more jail time. I think what we need you to know one more time is that we are diligently prosecuting these cases and we're going to investigate these cases thoroughly. We can't let these things go. Thank you so much, Sergeant Carpenter. Thank you. We have a terrific police force at Western and um, I really appreciate their participation in this project. So what did we find after creating this video? It was a three minute video. We showed it to some students, other students did not uh, see the video. It increased their knowledge, as you might expect, about Washington State cyber harassment laws and cyber stalking laws, the legal consequences, Western's computer use and harassment policies, resources for victims on campus, um, help um, that school authorities and university police can provide, as well as Western's policies for discussing the consequences for students who are found guilty of cyber harassment. So my point here is that those rules that we've been speaking of, the norms that we've been speaking out, more needs to be done. More needs to be done not only at universities, colleges across the country, but also at elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Children need to be presented with this information. It can easily be done on short videos like this. They need to understand what the consequences are. Another concept <clears throat> that's central to what we're discussing and that has increased dramatically in the last few years and the nature of that experience has changed radically in the last few years are violent video games and the experience of what's happening on a violent video game. People today are, I'm quoting, people today are bombarded by scenes of violence in mass media. All forms of media have become more graphic, realistic, and violent. But this is especially true for video games. In the past, violent video games featured cartoonish characters. Today, the characters' blood and gore are extremely realistic. One possible consequence of a chronic exposure is that people may be coming desensitized to it, meaning that they become more accepting of it, they become more used to it. Here's a study um, that found exposure to violent video games may increase aggressive thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. More than three quarters of parents say that violence in video games and movies and television contribute to violence in society. Well, let's find out. Here's a study recently published in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. These are all peer-reviewed studies, very well-designed studies, uh, very carefully evaluated and assessed. Um, the title of it is, This is Your Brain on Video, Violent Video Games, Neural Desensitization. They evaluated how the brain responds to being exposed to violent video games. Some participants had little exposure, some had a lot of exposure to violent video games, and what did they find out? They found that when playing violent video games, participants with little prior experience or exposure showed a reduction in the P3 component of the event-related brain potential to violent images. And what this shows is it documents desensitization in our brains to violent images. An incredibly important research project because before this, we didn't have evidence of what's actually happening in the brain. We had reports, people would report, or we could observe their behavior. This is actually studying what is going on in the brain. Critically, on a subsequent task, these desensitized participants acted more aggressively after playing the violent video game. Next study, how does this experience carry with you? If you play it the day before, does it influence your behavior that following day? They had people play this game violent video games, and what they found is that men who ruminated about the violent video game, ruminate means to think about constantly about that violent video game. These men were more aggressive 24 hours later. Why? Because, quote, rumination keeps aggressive thoughts, feelings, and behavioral tendencies active. If players ruminate about violence in a game, the aggression stimulating effects of the game persist long after it has been turned off. Here's a anonymous post on Amazon that says this person was playing a game called Resident Evil 5 and they kept thinking about it over and over and over again all through the weekend. Here's a very <laughs> fascinating question. Does playing a violent video game change what we think is moral? What we think is right? 
They looked at a concept called moral disengagement, which is when we revise our moral boundaries and believing that represent, reprehensible concept, conduct is more morally acceptable. They had people play Grand Theft Auto, a popular video game. Here are some images of that where people pretend to be criminals. It's very violent, shoot one another. Here are some of the scenes. What did they find? High school students who played GTA, Grand Theft Auto, reported higher levels of moral disengagement regardless of their age or regardless of their gender. And watch this. High school students were more likely to justify real life Immoral conduct, the more recently they had played the game, this is now taking that experience from the game to real life. If it's, I'm more accepting of it here in the game, and now it's carrying over into real life. What's the relationship between exposure to violent video games and cyberbullying? Now here's our connection with cyberbullying. Participants in this study are middle and high school students. Cyberbullies and victims are more than two times as likely to be exposed to violent video games compared to those who are not involved in cyberbullying. Bullies are almost four times as likely to be exposed to violent video games. This research is showing that participation in these experiences is having a meaningful impact on our children today. One component of this game that you need to be very aware of is it's not just sitting and playing a game. There's an interactive component. Kids have headsets, it has a microphone, it has an earpiece, and they're connected to other people playing this game. So there can be multiple players in that setting. You don't know who they are, you may know who they are, and you can talk to each other. And what do you do? You trash talk. You use profanity, you use obscenity, you use threats during these games, and if you don't know how to trash talk, you can go Google and find out how to trash talk. And here's an example of what somebody says. I had to cross some of the recommendations out, um, but they said if you do this, you will soon have your opponent be enraged, frustrated, and finally humiliated, and you can laugh hysterically at your opponent's pain. You can also buy a device so that if you're not quick enough to think on your feet, it says, to come up with trash talking sayings, you can pre-program it and push a button and it will trash talk for you. You can also go to sportsillustratedkids.com, website for children, which will also help you up your trash talking skills. Um, reality television, uh, some programs on various networks, cable networks, where we're seeing people in their real life. When do people watch these? When are they more likely to watch? When there's a lot of drama, and when there's a lot of what we're calling social aggression or relational aggression. Uh, it turns out that reality TV has a lot more of the social or relational aggression than scripted TV. Uh, social aggression or relational aggression is harming someone by damaging his or her relationships or feelings of acceptance. So it's spreading rumors, telling someone you're excluding him or her from the group. And it turns out, research, brand new research, shows that adolescents who frequently watch reality TV that, uh, that includes social aggressive behavior are themselves becoming socially aggressive. So the question that I'm asking is, are kids able to compartmentalize? Are they able to say it happened here in a video game, it happened here on TV, and that's where it stays? Or is it carrying over into their daily lives? <clears throat> so given all this, what can parents do? What can teachers do to help children? Parents need to be aware of what their children are doing. That means checking their Facebook, checking their phone, checking text. It's too late to find out when your child has made an anonymous threat that could subject him or her to a lengthy sentence. And this is a statement from a juvenile judge after a court case in Chicago. So I'd like to offer you 10 tips and issues to consider regarding use of the internet with children. One is that it all starts at home. Teach your child what behaviors are and are not appropriate on the internet and social networking sites. You are your child's primary role model. I've just shown you that internet sites, social networking sites are not presenting information they can understand. It's time that we need to get involved now. Give your child devices that are age appropriate. There are real safety issues when children are online. There are, we haven't 
you know, briefly talked about sexual predators, lots of other threats out there that you need to be aware of. Be aware that your child, when they access the internet or social networking sites, in essence, you're letting people who you may not know virtually come into your home and interact with your child. Think of that concept. If someone's knocking on your door at 8 o'clock at night and says, I wanna, I'm a stranger and I want to come in and talk to your child, in essence, that's what's happening online. Limit use of handheld devices. So this is my big recommendation. Again, I love wireless, I love handheld, but there's a time and a place for it. What's the alternative? A desktop in a shared room that can be monitored. You can have a nice big desktop with a nice monitor that has a touch screen uh, if you want that type of technology today. All internet activity, including homework assignments that require use of the internet, should be completed on this machine. Take appropriate measures to limit or prevent uh, unsupervised access via televisions, because now, as you know, via smart TVs um, or other devices, that's another way children can access the internet. Set clear rules specifying how your child can use the internet. These rules should state the amount of time he or she can use the internet, what sites or apps your child may access, how you will monitor his or her activity, and that you must know his or her usernames. Use filters to control what sites can be accessed. Filters, however, will not keep your child safe from cyberbullying. They will help minimize exposure to certain sites, though. If your child uses a wireless handheld device to listen to music, replace it with an MP3 player that cannot access the internet. Children love music, rightfully so, but if you want them to have access to the internet, there are implications of that. So you can still have an MP3 player, they can still listen to their music just using a different modality. Uh, likewise with a cell phone, you'll have to seriously consider whether you want a cell phone that connect to the internet or that simply makes calls. Help your child understand identity fraud and the legal consequences for pretending to be someone else. Help your child understand the long-term consequences of posting information or images that do not present him or her in a favorable light. And I'd like everyone to realize that employers today, when they receive a resume or an application for a job, they're doing much more than just looking at that resume or an application for a job. What are they doing? They're going to look at your profile online. They're going to find your Facebook page. They're going to find whatever they can to see how you're presenting yourself. And people are losing jobs. They are not getting hired because of that. And we keep hearing over and over again what's posted on the web stays on the web for many, 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 many years. That can have consequences. Carefully consider this research regarding violent video games and how it can affect children and whether you want to expose your child to this as well as consider how trash talking during these violent video games, or in any venue for that matter, may negatively affect your child. So this question of compartmentalizing the experiences in one domain and carrying over to another is what we're discussing here. And then moral compassion. We've seen this question of um, right versus wrong, but that we need help teaching moral compassion. So here are six tips. Help your child further develop more moral compassion, empathy, and self-awareness and good decision-making skills. Ask him or her to think about these following six questions and to consider the person's feelings before posting online. Number A, letter A. Am I being nice or am I being mean? Am I being respectful or am I being disrespectful? Would I be happy or upset if I said, if uh, someone said it about me or my good friend? What an adult that I respect. What would that person think about what I posted online? Would they think it was nice or mean? Do my words or actions follow or violate the rules that are set by my parents, by the user agreements for the site, or state laws? Would I be happy or upset if someone said it about me and if anyone <clears throat> anywhere in the world could read it? <clears throat> would my teacher, school principal, what would they think about what I posted? Would they think it was nice or mean? We need role models for children. We need role models to help children develop empathy. Uh, empathy includes affective components regarding feelings as well as cognitive components, understanding about reactions. Robert Coles quotes novelist Henry James whose nephew asked what he ought to do with his life and James replied, three things in life are important. The first is to be kind, the second to be kind, 
and the third is to be kind. And for Robert Coles, being kind reflects a strong commitment to helping others and empathy. And these are some of the skills that I'm asking. If we're talking about bullying, if we're talking about cyberbullying, to address them. A talk like this is helpful. Having someone come in and talk to the school for a day at an assembly is helpful. But all of our research, I can show you 40, 50, 60 years of research in the field of psychology, a one-time intervention won't work or it will be minimally effective. It needs to be repeated. But in addition, we have to lay that foundation and a moral base, this kind of moral foundation is essential. It also includes perspective taking, imagining the experience of the other person as well as yourself, how you would feel in that situation. So perspective taking then increases our emotional response to a person in need compared to the viewpoint of an uninvolved observer. Help your child strengthen his or her self-esteem and self-confidence and resilience to peer pressure. Learn how to stand up for those who have been harassed. Your child should feel he or she can discuss any situation with you. Help your child understand that on the other end, there is another person just like him or her who has feelings, that posts can hurt feelings, and that each screen name represents a real person who has real feelings. Help your child understand that what he or she posts reflects on his or her character. There are programs like the Jigsaw Classroom, here's the website, jigsaw.org, that are not necessarily designed for bullying or cyberbullying, but that they help children lay the foundation for moral character. They help children learn to interact. They help ch children learn to build those strong relationships with one another. And all of that will help toward reducing bullying and cyberbullying. If you haven't heard of John Hunter, please check him out. His website is worldpeacegame.org, an extremely gifted fourth grade teacher who has developed a phenomenal technique to get children to think about issues that are facing the world today, but it's that dynamic of interaction through this game that also can help build positive relationships. Jane Elliott in the 1960s with the Brown Eyed Blue Eyed program, many of you likely know of that. That type of program also can be very relevant for laying the foundation for understanding. I'm very pleased to tell you that on May 14th, about two months from now, we have a follow-up panel that will go in much more in depth into both cyberbullying as well as bullying issues. We have an expert panel, I'll be the moderator, and I'm pleased to say that Dr. Adriana Monago, Dr. Lucy Lewis, Dr. Farrah Green Palmer, Dr. Jean Freeman, and Police Chief Darren Rasmussen, all who are in the audience here tonight, will be your experts on that panel. It will be held on the campus of Western in the new Academic Instruction Center, room AW, Academic West 204. It'll be free and open to the public, so please feel free to come. You're welcome to bring children as well, and we will present information, but it'll be a wonderful forum to respond to your questions as well. And so with that, I thank you so very much for coming tonight. We have a few moments to um, uh, respond to questions. I may refer to some of these other experts here if you have certain questions. And um, please raise your hand and someone will come and bring you the microphone. So thank you so very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, I would submit that uh, as long as bullying is acceptable in the adult world, it's going to happen in our children's world. Our, our children watch us and copy us. And if we want them to stop bullying, we have to stop bullying. And there are lots of ways that we adults bully each other. It's a very, very powerful statement. We need to look at our own behavior. We need to look at our politics. We need to look at our behavior on the playing field during a soccer game, we need to look at our behavior too. We are the role models. Thank you for the very important comment. You raise important issues for learning in schools, and certainly there's an age appropriate level for allowing kids access to uh, tablet computers. And in, certainly in school classrooms, they, in the elementary level that can be controlled, what they can access. 
At the upper levels, we find that we really restrict learning the more we lay restrictions. And yet what's important is to have that ongoing, constant community discussion about moral behavior. Yeah. And just one last thing as an old pediatrician, if you give a kid a cell phone, you've got to tell them that I have, ac this is my cell phone. You can, you're using it, but I have access to it. I can see what you're doing. It, it is not a right for uh, someone who's under the age 18 to have a cell phone and do whatever they want with it. Thank you very much. You, do you know that some of the high, higher up execs for Google and other companies down in Silicon Valley send their children to a private school that does not allow their children to use computers at all in the classroom or at home for school assignments? These are the people who are developing the websites and the computer programs that all of us regularly use. And the question is why? It's encyclopedias. They have the bound book, which can be fun to look through. That's a skill to look through an encyclopedia as well, through a bound book, using an index and so on. Okay. Yes. That's how most of us uh, went through school, was the bound book, the encyclopedias. I think we turned out just fine. Uh, two questions for you. Um, does is this information being taught or, or uh, you know brought it forward into the high schools locally um, for the teenagers to know what I mean not all of it of course some of the stuff you have to kind of I hate to use the word dumb it down but you have to make it more simple mm -hmm. and then the second question I have is uh, uh, folks that are uh, chiming in on Instagram or Facebook that are also demeaning um, the student or demeaning an, a, a fellow person, are they also up for any kind of uh, punishment leg legally? Mm -hmm. So the law, kicks, the law kicks in in a couple areas, and, and if uh, Sergeant Carpenter would like to address that question in any more detail, you're most welcome to, but uh, as, you, as we heard from him, a threat is a key component of that. So if a threat was made to someone's well-being, the law absolutely kicks in. Um, it's important as well that students report to the school administration what's happening. There are, there's a state law now in Washington that requires the school to report. So that means that hopefully something will, um, will happen. In terms of what is being to, taught to high school students today, um, I'm extremely impressed with something that Bellingham School District did recently, which was bring in a um, police officer who's been serving for nearly 30 years who discussed um, online safety. He did not go into detail about cyberbullying, but he went into detail about online safety and had assemblies for children during the day for both middle and high school and assemblies for parents in the evening, both very well attended and those types of activities are important. But one of my concerns is I'm a social psychologist. I um, know that again, a one day program, program like that will make a difference, it will get people thinking about it, but a couple days go by and out of sight, out of mind. So other techniques need to happen, like what? If the gentleman who gave the presentation had sent out a sheet of paper that says, after coming to the presentation, I understand, blah, 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 and I agree to doing X, Y, and Z, and sign my name on it, make a commitment, and put that in a public place, make a big poster and have all the kids in a classroom sign it and put it on the wall in the classroom, now you've got commitment. It's a reminder, it's gonna serve as a prompt, and now you've got commitment, and people generally do not like to be hypocrites. They like to act consistently, and that kind of reminder and prompt and agreement that I signed this and I said I would do this influences behavior. That's the kind of follow-up, and this is a dynamic that unfortunately I see is not included in a lot of interventions, but we've got that knowledge. And so the panel that will be on May 14th is a diverse group of individuals who are each have their respective fields of expertise, but coming together can create something really, I think, rather dynamic and new. Yeah. I just wanted to add that um, if your kids are in the Bellingham Public Schools, that the middle school counselors have been teaching a bully-proofing curriculum for the last five years. Uh, and so they teach lessons. So I don't know if you're lucky enough to have your kids in, in any of those schools, but um, they've also been collecting data and looking at the effectiveness of their programs. 
So requiring maybe four lessons or so, maybe five lessons over the course of a few months um, for both sixth and seventh grade. So the middle school counselors are some of the best that I've seen in terms of them working together and coordinating across the district and, uh, and then tracking the effectiveness. So, so. I just wanted to add, I, I'm not sure all of the high schools have yet had it. So I believe that's so. I believe Seahome High School still has yet to go through that safety program, but my daughter said they've been to Fairhaven Middle School. It's great. She's teaching me lots of things from what she's learned. Good. Um, and I'm really sad I missed the parent opportunity to hear that. I think there was an opportunity at Squalcombe High School where the parents could go. Right. And so I think if people get on board, they can push Seahome High School to do that again for the parents is what I understand. So I'm hoping to hear that that happens. I don't know if that helps you, if you wanted to know when and how you could hear what the schools are teaching, so. So, part of your comment, parents learn, kids learn from parents, but parents also learn from kids. And that kind of relationship that you just heard about, I think is extremely important. And the schools do a good job, they can continue to build on that, where they're teaching kids, kids will come home and teach the parents about what to do and so on. Yes. Do you have examples of the graduated sanctions that schools are imposing um, middle or high school for bullying? Uh, the question is, are there examples of programs that schools are using? Can I ask either of you? Do you, can you speak to that? Consequences. Consequences of. Not necessarily proactive programs, but Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna defer to the gentleman, thank you. Uh, I can't quote exactly. You could look up online because that's an administrative procedure and it is at the Bellingham School District in Ferndale. You could look online under administration uh, and policies and procedures and there's something on cyberbullying and bullying. Yes. So I'd like to thank you for your commitment to the children in our community and throughout the state of Washington and thank you so very much for coming this evening. I'd like to thank you, David. Please give him a hand. I hope you enjoyed this very informative presentation and you had some good takeaway points. But again, if you'd like to learn more about bullying and cyberbullying, please feel free to join us on May 14th. So on behalf of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Department of Psychology, City of Bellingham, and BTV, thank you very much.